I'm Chaitanya. Uh, this paper is called All Atom Diffusion Transformers. Uh, I did this as an intern at Meta's FAIR chemistry team. Um, we've been talking a lot about foundation models and next generation representations of materials. So this is super relevant. Um, you know, we are going to have universal interatomic potentials probably soon, right? So what's next, right? Like, you know, what's coming next? And one of the things we've been thinking about is one of the next frontiers could be generative models. Generative models that unify all these kinds of systems, right? Because they're all atomic systems that are interactions of atoms with each other. So can we learn these shared physical principles of atomic interaction and learn to generate them? And importantly, perhaps generalize better to scenarios where we don't have a lot of data. Um, so we've been trying to build this, right? Like we want to start thinking about new architectures that are sufficiently general to solve these problems. Why can't we do this today? Like why can't we take what we have and do this already? Well, the current state of the art for generating chemical systems are diffusion models. But if you ever played with them, you know that um, they're a bit mathy, um, they're a bit complex. You're generating a product manifold of categorical um, information as well as continuous information. And your intermediate stages of your trajectory kind of look extremely unphysical. Um, and when you start doing more complicated things, when you start generating crystals, you start caring about periodicity, and then you need to start caring about floating point values with extremely specific ranges. Your losses look quite scary. This is okay, this works, you know? And then when you go to biomolecules, you need to do coarse graining. This works as well, but it's not unified, it's not clean. And we wanna think about how we can bring all of this together. So. Here's what we're thinking about, right? How do we build a model that can be used to sample, generate, perhaps condition on all kinds of chemical, chemical systems, and importantly, generalize and transfer across modalities? There are a few key ideas. The first one is simple. It's all atoms. This is not original. We are seeing this for predictive modeling, right? People are sort of able to train uh, predictive models where they embed molecules, crystals, perhaps biomolecules, all in the same latent space, and you see improvements across tasks. So this is exciting, and we know how to do this, right? We know geometric or equivariant graph neural networks are a really good fit. They work, they learn the physical symmetries and inductive biases in your data, right? And they kind of work this way. You can learn a per atom latent space, right? Um, and what's new and what's quite fresh is you can also throw all that away and you can throw a pure transformer and compute at this problem. And you can often, you know, you can often get the same performance, perhaps even better performance. And this is a really nuanced question, but you know, people have started talking about whether equivalence is dead. Um, we tried to ablate this. I'll show you some results as well later. But we can do this, right? Like we can learn shared embedding spaces of molecules and crystals. The second key idea is once you've learned that shared embedding space, you can train a generative model in latent space. So you can learn to generate latents of chemical systems and then map back to real data. This is another simple idea that's super successful for images, video, and a lot of continuous modalities. For molecular systems, it kind of enables something new, you know? So it's a two-stage process. And in the first stage, you, you kind of take this multimodal data that you have composing your chemical system, and you're gonna embed that to a latent, to a low dimensional set of floating point numbers per atom and then decode back to the same multimodal representation. But what you get is this nice compressed representation of floating point numbers. And this can be an equivariant or learned latent space as you like. Um, but the powerful part is that you can then use simple Gaussian latent diffusion or flow matching, which we've learned to really scale up in images 
uh, for molecular systems. And you can do classifier-free guidance to perhaps condition these models. But the, the, the simple idea is that generate latents and then reconstruct back to a crystalline molecule. And when you train this, you don't train on the actual molecules or crystals. You take your autoencoder, map every training data point to latents, and then train on that. So you're training your diffusion denoiser, your diffusion transformer, on latents to sample new latents. And then during inference time, you can sort of reconstruct from latents back to real um, systems. Idea three, um, and what we want to convey is doing this leads to some notion of transfer learning, some notion of generalization across chemistries, some notion of, you know, it's all atoms and we can benefit from thinking about things as all atoms. So here, right, what I want to say is systems like AlphaFold, right, they, they also present like unified models, but I feel like they never showed transfer learning, this notion of like learning and improving across different data modalities. Yes, you can bring it together, but do you improve? I think that's a sort of architecture or representation learning question. So the dream would be to sort of sample the entire chemical space, right? Um, obviously, this was an intern project, so we started with like more modest stuff, uh, small molecules from QM9 and uh, materials project crystals. And we start to benchmark really standard stuff like unconditional distribution learning and sampling from our model, just to see whether you can generate physically realistic and stable structures. So people already talked about these metrics, um, and I think a lot of people would sort of be aware of them. Um, so I want to like quickly give you the main messages here. Um, what we found, right, firstly was when we train these um, adits, these uh, diffusion transformers, they can perform as well or better than equivalent diffusion as well as language modeling based approaches. Um, and importantly, when we ablate equivariant variants versus non-equivariant, we found that the non-equivariant ones were doing better. If you know me, then you know like this broke my intuitions as well. And then when we scale up, right, like when we now sort of train jointly, then we saw that this joint training further boosted performance a little bit. Which, which we are pleased to see as, you know, like some notion of starting to see transfer learning and generalization here. Um, oops. And we have similar messages for molecules as well. The results are very similar. You know, again, like the sort of non-equivalent version of the model does better and benefits from transfer learning, um, which is again uh, quite exciting. Um, here are some samples, like, yeah, of course, it can generate, like, somewhat <laughs> realistic stuff. Um, this is, you know, obviously, like, we'd like to condition this and we'd like to make this practical. But as I said, we want to show, like, this proof of concept here. Um, and the last key idea is, so I'm not completely scaling pill, but I think when you have a lot of compute, it breaks some intuitions that you might form at academic scale. And I want to like share that with you as a fellow academic, okay? So equivalent nets, equivalent differences is harder to scale. And if you want to build like, let's say like foundation models or large models generally, right? You need to think about practical scaling. You may say it's more data efficient, but you need to think about practical scaling. And this is just an example to say that, you know, it's uh, much faster. I'm out of time, so. You know, what I want to say is we could see scaling laws, we could see predictable improvements of scaling to 500 million parameters. But you can't do this with an equivalent net, right? Unless an NVIDIA engineer sits with you, you can't scale it to billion parameters. So this is something to think about for us in academia um, as to like what are these trade-offs, which I'm quite happy to sort of discuss in my poster next to the door, um, and also happy to Ask, uh, answer any questions. Questions? Okay, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have another question. Um, 
Uh, you speak about uh, that Aquarian GNNs uh, are less scalable than uh, transformers. Maybe it's not due to equivariance, but due to GNNs. So, like, uh, as I know, GNNs in this task usually need some kind of, like, message passing, uh, which depend, yeah. which dynamically computed during uh, forward pass. Yeah. So, um, maybe we can uh, use equivariance with, like, transformers. As I know, there are some architectures that c yeah. could do it. Maybe yeah. equivariance can be uh, yeah. hold it with uh, like yeah. more fast inference. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think people are building this, you know, and I'm excited for this as well. I think it, this is an engineering uh, challenge. It's just that a lot more resources are devoted to scaling one module from PyTorch, the transformer encoder. Hey, uh, great talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you have a good sense for the amount of data that you need in non-equivariant versions to learn equivariance, so to yeah. speak, like to get the same, I guess, expectation yeah. of performance. Yeah. Um, yeah, must be some Eastern European. You have some. I think, I think it doesn't matter because you know, like, you can infinitely rotate your samples and empirically. Unfortunately, empirically, we have seen that rotational symmetries are really quick to learn. You know, like, learning rotational symmetries doesn't seem to be as hard as we thought. So I feel like it, it, it's not really a question of, like, how much data we need, to be honest. Like, this is just my intuition building these models. OK, yeah. ending on an open question. That's always great for future research. Let's thank Chaitanya one more time.